Well, let's get started. Um, so my name is John Richardson. I am the uh, Fall Count Director for uh, Hawkridge Bird Observatory. And uh, Russ Edmonds uh, very kindly asked if I would um, do a little presentation on uh, what we do, but more, uh, more specifically the joys of hawk watching, the basics and beyond. And the way that I wanna do this is, obviously it would be great if we were all together outside looking up at the sky and uh, actually observing what's flying over. So you got to use your imagination a little bit and I'm gonna to try to make it very basic uh, initially of what you need to do. If you've never been to a Hawk Watch before, if you were to go to Mackinac or you to come to Hawk Ridge and you would stop by and say hello um, and you'd never been before, this is kind of what I want you to get the gist of so that you can go to a Hawk Watch feel confident and most of all, have a wonderful experience. So I think with these sort of, um, what I'm going to present to you will hopefully uh, give you a, sort of a bit of a, a head start. So if you go to, go to a Hawk Watch, like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So, um, so where are we? Where am I right now? If, uh, if, if some of you are not familiar with where uh, we are, we're right where that, um, little uh, pin is there at Duluth in the very corner of uh, Lake Superior. And in the fall, it's a particularly good uh, place for hawk watching because of uh, the geography and all those hawks, which don't really like to cross uh, large bodies of water, hit that North shore and funnel down to Duluth. And there we are um, ready to count them. And uh, there is about a, about 50 years worth of data that we have. Um, but uh, let me go to my next. There we go. Okay, I just have to tap it. Um, so basics of hawk watching. What do I need? Well, binoculars would be uh, would would help. Uh, depending on where you go. Uh, I mean, and, and of course, this is hawk watching that you can do on your own. You don't have to actually go to a hawk watch. It's basically, there's so much going on above our heads during the spring and fall that we just don't really realize. Uh, so you can, you know, they don't just fly over hawk watches. They could be flying over your house or your cabin or your place of work or whatever. So, um, so obviously binoculars do help. And people always say, well, what kind of binoculars do I need? Um, if you go to a hawk watch, some hawk watches will actually loan you a pair, which is great too. Um, but you don't need to go and spend two, three thousand dollars on a pair of binoculars if you don't have them. Uh, you can, you can, you know, get, get by with, um, with, with with spending a lot less. People always ask, well, how strong do they need to be? And I personally use uh, ten by forty twos and. If you're not familiar with what that is, that's 10 times magnification, and the 42 is your field of width. You might have eight by 35, so they come in different sizes. You can even get 10 by 50s. They get really big. Uh, for hawk watching, I like the 10 bys just because a lot of times you're looking at birds that are at quite a distance. If you're in the woods and looking at things in the bushes and the trees, Generally, you don't always need such a strong, big pair of binoculars. Um, but um, and then, so if, so you 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 you've got your binoculars. You're going to go check the weather before you go because the weather is so important when it comes to hawk watching. Um, check the weather, see what's going to happen. Maybe the next two three days. If it's anything like Duluth, there's nothing. You, you can't look at the weather a week ahead because it can change so often. So if you're planning to go next two, three days, you can have a general idea. Is it gonna be warm? Um, and uh, is it gonna be cold? And always hydrate and bring snacks because you will get hungry. Um, and, and bring a chair, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people come up and, uh, and it's more comfortable and you're leaning back and you can see the sky a lot better. Um, and you can get dehydrated, just, uh, sit in there in the sun. You don't realize you're having fun and, uh, you forget about it. So do bring, uh, you know, plenty of, uh, fluids with you too. And, and most of all, if you're going to go hawk watching it, it, you know, just enjoy it. That, that's, that's whenever people come, I just want them to 
to enjoy it. it you, you're not there to become an expert. You're not there to know everything. Just come and enjoy it. And my experience is most Hawk watches that you go to, uh, there's always people that are willing to help, either they're a member of the public or the staff that we have. Uh, and I'm sure that I'm not sure what the setup is about at Mackinac, but um, you know, there's always people there to um, to help out. So things to consider: what can I expect to see? Time of year. The time of year can be really critical because not all the birds or not all the hawks go through at the same time. Uh, we can see um, it's going to be fairly similar, um, but you you will see. Uh, things start to move sort of late August. Um, and as you get into September, you're going to start seeing some of the smaller raptors that are. Uh, so if you, if you really want to see a goshawk, you might not want to go in early September. They tend to be a later bit. So do a little bit of homework. Um, and uh, I, I know that I saw that um, uh, the lady was, I think it was maybe Gail, was showing everybody the hawk uh, count um, uh, the, the data there. And you can go on there and there's tons of information and you can see when things generally come through. And often like hawkridge.org, uh, uh, hawkridge has all that sort of information on there of you know when birds come through. So September, you're gonna start to see a lot of the smaller uh, birds or uh, uh, hawks, broadwing hawks come through in September. And a lot of times it depends on what they're eating uh, kind of dictates when they come through. Uh, wind direction, another huge one. Uh, for example, in Duluth, if, if you've got south winds or east winds, um, you, 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 you're, if you're coming to see 10,000 hawks in a day, that might not be the best time to come. Uh, when those broad wings come through and you see the big sort of kettles of, of broad wings coming through, uh, you need the right conditions. So the wind is really important. These birds are coming from the north and they just wait until the conditions are right. And they're not as in big of a hurry to go south as they are when they're coming back in the spring. Uh, so in the fall, they're just gonna wait out, wait for those wind directions. For Duluth, if we see northwest winds in the forecast, we start licking our lips. That's what we want. Um, and, but, Nevertheless, it doesn't mean you're not going to see things if you don't come on days when the, wind, the winds are not condi the condi wind conditions are not ideal for that hawk watch. Because in my experience, people say, "Oh, there's no northwest winds. I'm not coming." But I'm like, "No, you you really should because you may not see a thousand hawks, but you may see fifty really close because the birds adapt to the different wind wind." Uh, conditions. A lot of times, when it's northwest winds, yes, you might see thousands of birds but they're little specks way up in the sky. So if you really want to get a good look, and I would really encourage you to do that too, because there's nothing better than seeing a goshawk or a sharp shin or any of them, all the birds just coming through nice and low, right over your heads, and you can really get a good look at them. Um, so, so the wind direction is, it is important, but if it's not perfect for the big pushes of birds, don't worry. Bird will still be migrating more, more often than not between September, October, November. Um, and sometimes people come and they're having so much fun and they, some people kind of get the gist of it, you know, right away. And they're saying, did you get that one? Did you get that one? Did you get that one? So you're having so much fun. Can you help? A absolutely. There may be ways to help, but you, you, a lot of times people will try to point out every bird to you to the, to the counter and the count staff and just assume that they've probably got it. Do we see every bird? No, we miss stuff, but it can be kind of distracting. So you can really help by just enjoying yourself. Absolutely ask questions. And most staff are, are very good at, at saying, you know, I'm just busy at the moment, but I'll get right to you or somebody else can help you. So, but do have fun. Um, and there are, there are other ways to help. So, so how do I know what I'm looking at? Well, I want to start off with the basics. Two things that are so important is the shape and the behavior of the bird. 
we're not looking when we're when we're at a hawk watch when you're at a hawk watch you don't have the beauty of the bird being right in front of you like it is in a field guide and the the, the behavior of the bird can change uh, its appearance uh, or it can help determine what it is uh, also the weather the light it, it, it can really affect what you're looking at so I always say, you know, don't rush to judgment. If I'm teaching an intern or, or just with anybody, and, and then I can tell that they're really keen to learn is just stay on the bird, just enjoy that one bird. Don't worry about what else is going on. And, um, and always just wait for the bird to tell you what it is, or at least narrow it down. And it really is kind of detective work. It's a, a process of elimination, really. Has it got a long tail? Does it have broad wings does it have pointy wings all these kind of things that we're going to look at um so shape and behavior are key really um what is the bird doing and we get it wrong the experts often get it wrong and i'll be the first to put my hand up and say yep i got it wrong and that really makes everybody feel a little bit uh at ease that you know and 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 I have a lot of respect for those hot counters that say, you know, I, I, I got it wrong. So don't feel bad about getting it wrong. It doesn't, it's totally fine. That's how you learn. Um, and birds don't always do what they're supposed to do. You think, well, a, a, you know, a, a, a turkey vulture flies with its wings in the V. Well, that particular moment, if you're just looking at it and the wind's doing something or the bird's doing something, it, you know, it can throw you off or, the wind is affecting its wings so they look more folded back and it looks more like a falcon than it does uh, a broad wing hawk. So they don't always do what you're supposed to do, what they're supposed to do, so don't worry. And again, take into consideration the light um, and also the time of year. Uh, that, that could really help you. If it's the end of November, the chances that you're seeing a broad wing hawk, for instance, is probably gonna be fairly you, not not a big chance. Um, so the time of year can really help you determine or reduce, you know, sort of uh, go through those uh, that sort of checklist of what am I looking at. So what I've done is I, I wanted to just talk about the basic families that we see, and I'm assuming that Mackinac is going to be fairly similar um, in terms of the species that you see. Uh, and I've I've tried to leave out. Well, I purposely left out some of those oddball ones like Swainson's hawk or Mississippi kite, just to sort of not overload you. I mean, we want this to be fun and and sort of learn uh, the basics with a little bit extra. So, so I've, I've the different types of families that we get. We got the falcons. Um, so, if you're familiar with a peregrine falcon or a kestrel, uh, budios, those soaring hawks, red tail hawks broad wing hawks, rough leg hawks later in the year. The occipitas, which there's three in that family. If you have feeders and you have a hawk in town coming around your feeders, good chance it could be a Cooper's hawk. Uh, up north, you may well see goshawks. And the other one is the small um, sharp shinned hawk. So eagles, two species, the golden and the bald eagle. One species of harrier, the northern harrier, osprey, and vultures. I just limited it to turkey vulture. Um, we're a little bit far north for that, so I'm going to leave that one out for now. So what I did is I chose pictures that are not perfect, because what you've got to realize if you've never been to a hawk watch is, again, they're not right there in front of you like they are in a field guide. So I, I purposely made them not the best photos, but what I wanna get down is those basics, the basic shape. I can't do the behavior really because it's not, uh, I, can, I can't make them move. Um, but what you can see here with the falcons is those pointy wings. We can see on the castro on the left and the Merlin in the middle and on the right, the peregrine, those long pointy wings. So that's a pretty good, that's again, that, that's sort of going through that process of elimination. 
they have kind of a, like a, the kestrel here has a fairly long tail. You're not always afforded the, uh, the ability to see the plumage. You might not be, it might be sort of a cloudy sky, diffuse sky, and you're just seeing a shape. And these birds can be really high. So initially just try to focus on the ones that are fairly nearby. You don't have to worry about every single one. And usually if it's pretty, something pretty good, word's gonna get around and they'll try to get you on it. But essentially what we're looking at is the shape. So these long pointy wings, very typical in the falcon family. And you'll see how the other ones differ. I, I didn't wanna go into too much of the detail, um, but I, essentially here, just go into the family group. Obviously size, there's gonna be a huge difference between the Kestrel, Merlin, and the Peregrine. And I can't really do that justice here, but I'm assuming that most people have a field guide and you can look at the dimensions and you'll see that there is a big difference. Um, so, so that's the falcons, uh, long pointy wings, relatively, that's a medium um, uh, length tail. Uh, now the tail on this Merlin in the middle could easily be confused as other hawks, but those pointy wings are quite telling. So you've got your field guide. Here we go. You've got your Castro Merlin and Peregrine. And if they were two feet above your head, this is more of what you would see. And there, when these birds are in silhouettes like they are at the bottom, which is often what you're looking at, there are ways that's where the behavior comes into it. They all do something slightly different. And I put this on here. Uh, again, they don't always do what they're supposed to do, but in general, the, 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 the kestrel is gonna be a little bit lighter in its flight. Um, Often in the fall, they're catching dragonflies as they migrate south. You'll see them doing that. So that's another way that you could uh, eliminate certain species because uh, the falcons really like to catch dragonflies on the wing. Um, the merlin always seems like it's in a desperate hurry and is very fast. Um, of course, yes, it, 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 it's, you, you can get it wrong. It can be a kestrel, it can be a merlin, but essentially, what we want to do with the basics is just remember, look at the pointy wings, look at the shape and look at the behavior. And a peregrine is going to be bigger, much, much bigger, um, much more stronger flight. Um, and it, this can't, you can't really do it justice until you're actually there, but I'm hoping that this will help you when you do go and you are observing that it will help somewhat. Uh, so the three, they're the three falcon species that we get. Um, these are all from uh, uh, Sibley's uh, uh, Bird Guide to North America, the second edition. It's actually, they're actually from my app, um, but they work pretty good. So if you have that, that's exactly what we're looking at. So the Budios, the three general species, main species that we get and that you're probably going to get uh, at Mackinac is the, the red tail hawk, which is most people are familiar with, even if you're not really into birds or hawk watching, everybody's generally heard of uh, the red tail hawk. And I, I, I just chose an adult sort of Eastern type because um, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of I mean, I could go on for hours, so I'm just, I don't want to overload, but so this is just a regular run of the mill red tail here. You can clearly see that red tail, the belly band. Um, and with the soaring hawks, what we're looking at is the short tail and the broad, long broad wings. So where we had the pointy wings narrow at the end, the red tail here, the, this, this soaring hawks, the Budios is much different. These birds need that broad wing base for soaring and just hanging out, looking down, looking for prey. Speed is not necessarily the MO. Um, it's more over high soaring around and then uh, locating their food and then a bit of speed comes into it. Um, 
And here, I mean, you're looking at, if you look in the middle of the Broadwing Hawk, the one on the top, he actually looks like he's got fairly pointed wings there. So that's that thing where, oh, it had pointy wings. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was a falcon. So, you know, just watch the bird. If you have the ability, the time, eventually it will hopefully identify itself for you. Uh, but the, uh, the Broadwing Hawk is uh, quite a bit smaller than the, um, the red tailed hawk. And this is a species that we see in big numbers in a short space of time, usually around middle to late September. And I'm sure that uh, if you've been to Mackinac, you've seen Broadwing hawks. And you can really see this, this is an adult in the middle here. And you can really see the difference in the tail. Um, and it's got that sort of those lateral um, barring on its. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, horizontal barring on its tail. And if you can see that, that's great. But as you were to go into more an advanced mode, we're not taking into consideration the juveniles because the juveniles don't have that. So um, maybe, for, maybe for next class. Um, but essentially these are adults. And uh, again, the, the Budio short tail, long broad wings. And these are primarily uh, amphibian um, reptile hunters. They love frogs, that kind of thing. So once that type of food becomes unavailable or less available, it's time to move. And that's why we see them really moving in the big numbers uh, that we do. You can get big days of um, red tails, uh, but, uh, but it's usually the, the brawling hawks that are the most common. And the rough-legged hawk, uh, the Arctic nester, uh, often a later in the season as you get into October and November, and you can clearly see the difference. I'm just using light morphs here. I'm not gonna go into the morphs, otherwise it gets into a bit of a rabbit hole, but essentially what we commonly see uh, in this area in Eastern US is gonna be the sort of Eastern red tail, the light morph broadwing hawk, uh, the rough leg, we do tend to see a little bit more of a crossover between uh, a little bit more of the dark morph and the light morph, but essentially you can really see the difference. We've got long broad wings, fairly short tail, uh, but this heavy, heavy belly band here with the, uh, if you will, the, the, the black on the wrist, that big, that black patch, you can see it on the bottom one clear. And notice how that's absent in the red tail and the red tail has those lovely little black shoulder blades or the patagial streaks. If you see those black shoulder blades like that, it's probably gonna rule out, especially with the red tail, but it's gonna rule out the rough legged hawk. So those nice carpal patches, those black dots on the wrist and that heavy belly band, um, you can get red tails with a heavy belly band. So you've got to kind of go down the list, you know, how many boxes can you check? Um, because a juvenile red tail hawk doesn't have a red tail. And again, that gets into more of the more advanced uh, stuff. Um, but to wrap up the Budios, we've got that long tail, sorry, short tail, long broad wings. And you can see here as uh, the, the Sibley um, slides here, basically what I was showing you. So it does give you a little bit more of the, on the red tail, the adult and the juvenile. Uh, I was just focusing on the adult. And then on the rough leg talk, we can see the, the, the dark morph and the light morph. Um, uh, and across the broad wing, you can clearly see the, the white bands um, on the tail. And it doesn't have those, uh, it's much more uh, clear on the wrist. So it says the pale with the dark border. Um, there are certain things that they can do uh, in, in terms of behavior, a lot of times the, the rough-legged hawk will fly with a little bit of a, a dihedral, that V in the wing, but you can get fooled. So I'm kind of going to lay off that a little bit, but can you identify it as a booty -o? You know, with those basics, I'm hoping that, does it have a short tail? Does it have the long, broad wings? Well, it has a red tail. Does it have the black and white in the tail? Does it have the black on the wrist? those kind of things, so you can kind of eliminate, assuming that the light is good enough and it's close enough. <laughs> so the occipitus, 
Uh, most common is going to be the shark shin hog. Um, probably you've seen one even if you didn't know what you were looking at. A uh, fairly uh, abundant hawk um, come through in really good numbers. I'm sure they do through Mackinac. Uh, the occipitas do have fairly broad wings, but they've also got that really long tail. That's the key with the occipitas, that really long tail. Um, the, the, the wings are broad, but they're not, they're not really that long. Uh, when we get into the Harrier, you'll see both the combination of the long tail and the long wings. Um, the pictures don't necessarily do it justice until you see it. But uh, what I try to, again, again, we're looking at what is it doing? What is its behavior? And some of these bears have very, very easy telltale signs. A sharp shinned hawk, you may have heard it, flap, 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 glide. And that's a lot of the time what they're doing. They're flap, 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 glide. And they're not sort of a constant uh, wing beat like a, like a falcon would be. Um, and they're not, they will soar, but they're not soars in the same way that maybe uh, a red tail is. Um, so again, we've got to just kind of go through that checklist in our mind of what is the shape and what is the behavior. Um, and sharp shin hawks and Cooper's hawks are always the one that that still trip up the best. I, 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 the, what I always, uh, and now we, we always joke about this, and I know Rose Edmonds uh, will be familiar with this too, that um, because you've got big size differences in raptors. Um, in the, 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 the generally, the, the, the females are 30% bigger than the males. So, what can appear to look like one particular species might actually be a different one because of the size. So if you've got a female sharp shin hawk that's 30% bigger than a male, but then you've got a Cooper's hawk where the male is much smaller, maybe similar size to a sharp shin, it can get a little confusing. So don't feel bad about IDing uh, occipitas. And usually there's people at a hawk watch that will point things out. So that's of real help. So, and then it's just repetition of seeing these birds, seeing these birds, and you start to get used to what they do, how they behave, what the shape is. And um, so um, the, the, the long tail is, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at these hogs, why do they, why does one have a long tail? Why does the other, why does this one not? Um, these birds are a very, adapted to living in living in in tight tight corners of in woods and undergrowth and that tail is like a big rudder and they can turn and twist extremely quickly and they have particularly long legs which is partially where they get their name from the occipitas which is a comes from a french word actually to to grasp because they got long legs and they use those long legs to grasp into the bush to grab a little bird or whatever it is they're after. Um, sharp shins in particular often follow those little birds as they're uh, migrating north and migrating south, the yellow room warblers and juncos um, are particular favorites. So short broad wings, long tail, flap flap glide is very, uh, uh, very commonly used when we're talking about occipitas. Uh, Cooper's hawks, we don't really get Cooper's hawks that much up here. We're kind of on the, the limit of their range. We, we get very few. Um, but they, what we often tell people is the sharp shin hawk uh, looks like a, an uppercase T. They have a fairly short head and that long tail, so they look an uppercase T. The Cooper's hawk tends to have a much bigger head. Hopefully that's what you're seeing. And it looks more like a crucifix. Um, the tail tends to be longer. And usually when you see a Cooper's hawk, then it's a Cooper's hawk. If you're, mm, is it, is it, is it? Generally, it, it's, it's like, you know, when it, when it is, you, you know, it stands out um, because you, your mind can kind of play tricks with you. And sometimes we see what we want to see. Um, and then the big one, the, the goshawk. I, I just used um, the juveniles here, and we'll see in a second the, um, the, the adults, but 
I wanted to show what we generally see at Hawk Watches because you're seeing a lot of young ones. Uh, that's going to be the vast bulk of them. So what we're looking at here can, can be quite confusing. Um, often what they'll say is on the Sharpshin Hawk and this top picture on the left is they've got bulging secondaries. So like under here kind of bulges out and you don't see that so much in the more slender wing of the Coopers, but the Goshawk does have the bulging secondaries. Also, it's a minor technical thing that you might not always have the privilege of seeing. Um, but the other thing too, is you'll notice on the Goshawk that that heavy streaking on the belly goes all the way down to the tail. On the Cooper's Hawk and on the Sharpshin, you generally don't see that. You should be able to separate Sharpshin from Goshawk because Goshawks are almost the same size as a red tail, but uh, we all get we all get confused. The birds are not always five feet above our heads. They could be a thousand feet up, a mile over to the left, flying away from you. Who knows? So, but the long tail, sh fairly short, broad wings, and you'll notice also on that bottom picture of the goshawk that they have an uh, they have an eye stripe, uh, very typical of the goshawks, and you'll see that in the pictures. I wish I could move my, this, the gallery thing, but um, I'll go with it. So here we can see all the three, um, the, the, the three different species, um, long tail, short broad wings, and uh, the goshawk again is much, much bigger. Um, so uh, you may see more Cooper's Hawks there. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Eagles, only two in this, uh, in this group. Uh, they are actually in separate families. And one thing that I always talk to people about is the amount of golden eagles that they've seen. And although they may be seeing the odd golden eagle, they're probably not seeing eight to 10 all at once. Um, so what they're getting confused with is what is, you know, what is the difference between a bald eagle and a golden eagle? Majority of you have already seen a bald eagle, know what an adult bald eagle looks like, white head, white tail. If it's an adult, no problem. It's when you get into the, the, uh, the, the younger birds where it gets a little trickier because the young bald eagles, the young uh, golden eagles and the adult golden eagles are, there's a lot of brown there. There is some white as we can see in these bottom two pictures. And what we have is for both species is the top birds are the adults. You'll notice that the golden eagle is all brown. There's no white head, no white tail, but unless you've got a really good look at it, it may just look like a young um, bald eagle. One thing that I always try to tell people is if it has white on the armpits, so if it's got white right on, on the edge of the, the belly there, this is, I think this is probably like a second year, a two-year-old bird. Uh, it takes them five years to become a full adult uh, in the bald eagle. So each year they do change their appearance and in, in they're all generally the same for each year. Um, but if you see white on the, on the underside right here of the wing, it's not a golden eagle. And a lot of times that's what people think that they're looking at. Uh, the, gold, the golden eagle, the juvenile, this one on the bottom here, you can see there's no white in the armpits, but it's got those white wrists, those big white spots. And if you're lucky enough to see those that's kind of a clincher. And the golden eagle has a small head. If it, it doesn't always do it justice, but if you're looking at the both adult birds, you can see that that head on that bald eagle is, is, is quite big. The other thing too is golden eagles will actually fly with a little bit of a V in their wing, where a bald eagle is just like a, just like a big long plank, like a big cigar. Um, and again, if it's got the white head, white tail, that helps. Um, but the golden eagle will tend to have its wings slightly up and, and almost those fingers kind of flare up a little bit. Again, you're not always afforded that. So look at the head, look at the tail. 
They don't have a long tail. The, the golden eagle has a, does have a slightly longer tail. It's more proportioned uh, in the bald eagle tail to, he tail to head. And if you can see in that juvenile, the tail does look quite a bit longer than that smaller head. So, but if you can look at the underside of the bird, if the light's good enough, you can generally, well, it's an eagle. Does it have the white on the underside or is it on the wrist? Um, is it completely brown like the adult? So that should be able to help you identify which species it is. And here we are with uh, Sibley's illustrations. Uh, we can see that long plank-like um, cigar-shaped body of the bald eagle. And then the underside, here's a juvenile um, with those white on the underside of the armpits. You gotta be careful because you'll see that white in the tail of that juvenile bald eagle. And you look at the white in the, the juvenile golden eagle, they can be tricky. They can be, they can be tricky. They can fool you. So you have to be careful because as this bald eagle gets older, he's going to start getting more white in the tail. And, you know, you're not always looking at a still bird um, and the lights can be difficult and things like that. So just watch the bird, just enjoy it. Take your time. Don't rush to judgment. And eventually the bird usually, uh, will tell you what it is. But of course, you've always got to let some go. And that's just the way it is. And don't worry about it. Um, the golden eagle, we can see that white in the tail. And on the top, it's more of a narrow, smaller uh, band of white. And it's got those, uh, got the white in, on, the, uh, on, the, on the wrists there. And of course, the adult doesn't have any of that. Now, when they're coming, when they're flying towards you and the lights on them, boy, that that gold really does shine um, and uh, you really see where it gets its name from. Uh, osprey uh, or fish eagle is a lot of uh, fish hawk as a lot of people might re re refer to. Uh, often we're seeing them in September. They start to tail off here in, in October. So if you think you're seeing an, an osprey in late November, Again, that time of year can, uh, can really make a difference. And with the osprey, if you've ever observed them, you'll notice that they have that sort of M shape in the wing, uh, or, or a lot of times can almost look like a gull um, at, at a distance. But that is a, the, the reason they have these wings like this is a, a, a physiological uh, difference to the other birds. They're using these, uh, the, 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 these, the, when they dive into the water to catch a fish, they're using that top part of the wing to rotate, to get out of the water, to get up with their fish or whatever it is they have. Um, so they're a little bit different in, in physiologically. And you can see that they, they don't have a belly band, just nice and clean on the underside, um, slightly pointy wings, but they're, they're quite long, but that M shape often is really a great clue uh, if you're looking at an osprey. Because in migration, they can be high. They're not just floating around over the lake looking for a fish. These birds, when they're going, they're going. And you know, they're, they're coming through. They're, they're, they're the, the ones that are migrating are not going by. So they're not always doing what you think they would be doing. They're not hunting, they're, they're migrating. Um, so, um, so yeah, you'll see, you'll see the, the osprey and you can see in the sort of silhouettes there. And I like these silhouettes because a lot of times that's what you're looking at. You're not looking at what's on the left. I wish it was always that way. Um, and in the fall, you can quite often see the juveniles. In the spring, you're always seeing the adults because the juveniles don't come back the first year. They go south and they don't come back. Um, so you can always be sure, you can always impress your friends by saying, um, oh, that's an adult. <laughs> um, and, you, and you're probably right. So, um, so that's, the, that's the osprey. And an osprey is a bird that you can find um, pretty much all around the world, uh, certainly uh, circumpolar. But we, uh, I'm from Europe. Uh, we don't see them in the numbers that we see here. We're extremely fortunate. So Northern Harrier. 
really cool bird. Um, wonderfully evolved. Uh, we can see, remember I said earlier about the, the, the long tail and the long wings, and they're kind of pointy uh, depending on their, uh, you, know, you know, what they're doing at a particular moment. But, um, but these long wings, they, 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 these are the ones that you'll see kind of just kind of gliding over the marshes with a, the wings sort of in a little bit of a V, uh, just coasting along and um, they're, they're looking for mice and small birds and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the male, which is in the left-hand picture, or gray ghost a lot of times people refer to them as, the black fingers, very real distinctive if you see that. Um, the rest of it is fairly white. And the bird on the right is also a harrier, but I chose this one because this is what you will see a lot of here. Sorry, my third clock is talking to me. Um, I wish it was warm enough for that species, but it's not. Um, this is a juvenile. The juveniles have that really nice, rich orange. They're not a matte brown like a female. Uh, so you can really see that, uh, that wonderful reddish brown, um, almost burgundy color. Uh, it, it doesn't really do it justice. But the long tail, long wings, and often they're, when they're migrating, they, their wings they almost look like they're bouncing a basketball. If you just imagine you're bouncing a basketball, it's kind of very steady and, 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 and there's one way to learn it that, they're, that, that it, you, you see that. Um, and they're not flying over marshes when they're migrating where we are and probably where you are when they're migrating. A lot of times they're going high um, or over the treetops at least, uh, just depending on the wind, winds. But, uh, but a really cool bird, very highly evolved has kind of a facial disc. I don't know if we can see it here in this one. Um, it doesn't really show it, but you can kind of see it in that juvenile one at the bottom. Um, but they have kind of facial disc, kind of like an owl. And they're using that for listening as they're flying over the marshes and they're just listening for, for sounds. Um, another tip, you gotta be careful though, is the white rump. You'll see on the on the bottom, the top of the tail, you'll see that white patch. Now there is another bird, the rough-legged hawk, they can have that, so you have to be careful. But if you see that white rump, it's narrowing it down because there's really only two that have that white rump like that. Um, so that should help. So if you do see that white rump, that's a big key um, that it could be a harrier. Uh, then it's just a matter of, uh, you know, again, going through your list, what's going on. I mean, obviously if it's nice and white with these black fingers and the trailing edge of the, you can see that that's an adult uh, harrier, um, but it can get a little tricky when it's, the light's not great and you're dealing with brown birds. It can be really, you know, quite confusing. Um, and finally, the, the, the turkey vulture. really quite different from the, all the other raptors uh, that we've talked about, mainly because it's a scavenger. Um, okay, bald eagles can be scavengers, but they know how to hunt too. Generally, the, the, the turkey vulture is primarily a scavenger and it doesn't have the talons um, to do what uh, the, 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 the rest of the raptors do. But we put, we call, we get a lot of, you know, you see plenty of them, we call them raptors. Um, what these two photos really indicate is that difference between the silvery trailing edge and the, the dark black um, leading edge and the black belly. You can really see that contrast and that tiny little head, it really doesn't appear to have a head. Its head's probably not that much different proportionally to other raptors, it's just it doesn't have feathers on it. Um, so it gives the appearance almost in that left-hand picture that it doesn't have a head, um, but it does. It's got good eyesight and great sense of smell. And, and again, a lot of times you'll see those vultures, they're just, they're teeter-tottering in the wind, V-shape in the wing. Um, 
often that's what you'll you'll see. And turkey vultures can fly almost on any kind of wind. They're big. They're you know not that much difference uh, in sort of uh, you know sort of if you look at a diagram than a bald eagle, but they're they weigh half of that. They're very light. Um, they're all feathers, really. Um, uh, not a lot of bulk. They don't need that power because what they're eating is already being taken care of, uh, died or got hit by a car or whatever. So um, they don't need that muscle the same way that uh, the other ones do. So they're our cleanup, they're our cleaners. Um, they're the ones that often you'll see in the ditch or um, circling above uh, in, in, in large groups. And actually people say, oh, turkey vultures are so ugly. I, I just, they're one of my favorites to watch in terms of flying at a hawk watch. If you go to a hawk watch and you see them just effortlessly cruising up and down the ridge, I, I think it's just absolutely fantastic. So uh, I think they're really sort of an underappreciated um, uh, bird. So, and you may have seen uh, Vultures doing this where they're drying out their wings or they're warming up with their wings out like that. Um, and you can see in the uh, the silhouette illustration, you'll see the um, that V in the wing. Those wings are kind of up. And, and again, it's all just about practice. Just go and enjoy it and have people help you and uh, just enjoy the day. Take it all in. Um, and slowly you will start to pick up. Start with the easy ones. Don't be worrying about trying to be an expert right away. Just enjoy it. Bring your chair, um, bring your water, bring a hat, and you, you'll you'll have a great time. Um, so, and then the one thing that I didn't talk about is as you get into more of the the more uh, beyond stuff, which I I I didn't want to go too much in I really what kind of wanted to stay for the basics um but often you can get a bird that looks completely weird and this bird in particular uh was a bird that we banded um and released at Hawkridge uh two or three years ago and this is a red-tailed hawk some species do are more prone to having albinism um and he had a couple of tail feathers that were red and a couple of wing feathers that were normal, but the rest of him was just white. So sometimes you get these oddball birds. Sometimes you're seeing a bird and it doesn't have a tail. It has what they call shock mole. Um, it can really throw you off. So don't worry about those odd things right away. Just focus on the basics, just enjoy it and slowly, slowly, uh, and I've, I've seen it. People come up to the Hawk Watch, complete novice, and they come and they just enjoy it. And before you know it, they, they got the hang of it, you know, it, it, and, and they, they, they just enjoy it the same way they did the first time that they came. So, so you know, don't, don't worry about the, the things that are odd right away. Just focus on enjoying it. Um, I'm not sure because I started late. I apologize. But I wanted to give people the opportunity to uh, ask some questions. So I don't know if you have the ability to, uh, how we want to do that. Um, hey, John, this is Josh here. Hi, Josh. Uh, wonderful, just a wonderful program. Uh, really enjoyed your speaking style. And, and we did have a couple comments come in sure. thanking you uh, for, for what a wonderful program you provided. So I wanted to share that first. Um, and oddly okay. enough, we don't have any questions so far. I, I, uh, I so covered folks, <laughs> You did. I was going to say, uh, I think you did a great job because uh, you've answered everyone's questions uh, <laughs> before they could ask them. Um, oh, one just came in. Uh, confusing Harrier and the Cooper's Hawk. Uh, the person wants to know if, if that's normal. <laughs> um, they... they you know, I, 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 again, depending on the situation, the light, the conditions, they can throw you off. Generally, uh, a Harrier is going to be much slower in its motions uh, in traveling, where a Cooper's Hawk often is, he's going somewhere. So, you know, again, it's going through that list of, of, of what could it be? What was it doing? Shape and behavior. Sometimes you got a split second and that's it. And you think... 
oh, I swore it had a long tail, or I could have sworn it had pointy wings. Sometimes you just got to let them go. So folks, start focusing on the ones that uh, you have the time to watch and enjoy. Um, anything can be confused with anything. I've actually, and I will tell you this, I've, I'll be honest, I saw two leaves rolling around at the same time that we were watching uh, Courting Bald Eagles, and I could have sworn these two distant leaves that were tumbling were two bald eagles, and I put my binoculars up, and I'm like, oh, guys, look at this, and it was two leaves. So you can confuse anything with anything. So don't, don't feel bad. Hey, uh, Josh, we did have a question from Kathy uh, Bricker about the clothes. Is it, uh, she's asking whether it, it makes sense to wear camouflage when you're at a hawk watch. Uh, are, are the birds seeing your clothes? Um, generally, I would not worry about it. We do have people that will come dressed, you know, ready for combat, uh, but it's not always necessary. In my experience, it just doesn't, it doesn't affect them at all because, I, well, maybe I should start wearing camo and see if it actually makes a difference. Um, but in my experience, it doesn't make a difference. These birds are very focused on what they're doing. Um, you, you may feel better wearing a darker type of clothing if it's cold or, uh, but really I wouldn't worry about it. Just wear what's comfortable, what's pertinent to the weather conditions. And, and I mean, obviously you don't need to be jumping up and down and, you know, whistling, uh, you know, making a noise. Uh, but uh, generally, I wouldn't worry about it. There was kind of a related question about kids. Yeah. And if you're trying to teach this to kids, yeah, I mean, are you are you paying attention? Are you helping them ID the birds? Are you focusing them on on something else? What in in what age do you think? Uh, is good age to begin to introduce kids to this? Well, one thing I absolutely love is allowing the kids to come up on the platform and and be part of what we're doing. And obviously, a lot of times it's, it's you know, it's age appropriate, but we'll get these little kids, they got their little binoculars and, it, and, and like, oh my gosh, they're letting me up on the platform and I'll give them a clicker and, and, and you know, at that age, they just want to, they just want to click and they just want to count the birds. You know, you're just instilling some confidence and some, some the making it fun. And, and Russell probably attests to this. He's saying, give them a clicker and oh yeah, click it. And they feel that they're part of it and just get them excited about it. And then, you know, if they come back and you can sort of slowly ramp it up. And a lot of times it just depends on what's age appropriate. Sometimes we get people come up I'm a little frightened because they know a lot. I mean, they come prepared. We'll have you know, there's one girl, I'm sure she won't mind me uh, mentioning her name, Harper. She's, she comes up every year. She's got her binoculars, her book. She, I mean, she's got everything and she really knows her stuff. I mean, she takes it seriously. So it all really depends. But at the end of the day, just make, make kids feel welcome, make it fun for them. And it's about instilling confidence in them. Nature will wow you regardless that you don't need to do that let the let the birds do that um and everything else but if you can introduce it to them and 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 just show them and make them feel part of it that that for me is the, the major thing and and uh, i'm not sure Mackinac, but we have a banding program where we do bring raptors up and the kids are able to see them and i mean it can be life-changing so uh, to actually see and uh, see these birds up close. So, yeah, it just really depends on the age, but I, hopefully that kind of answered your question. Yeah, and then then I had one question, a more of a general question. You're somebody that spends a lot of time, you know, collecting a lot of data. What are the general trends in a lot of these raptors? Are population-wise, are they, are they holding steady? Are they, what, what's going on? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, some are steady, some we're losing, and others are gaining. Bald eagles, in the, if, if, if any of you were around in the 70s and 80s, you probably remember never seeing a bald eagle. And uh, 
we prior to 1991, I think we were lucky if we would count about 100 bald eagles in a season. Uh, you know, now we're averaging six to 7,000 in a season. You know, we're getting big, big days. I mean, we had uh, a couple of springs ago, we had 1,076 in one single day migrating through. So they're, they're, they're a real success story. And it's kind of becoming part of the dialogue now that, ooh, maybe we've got too many. Um, that they may be pushing out other species. And uh, so I don't know, I'll leave that sort of controversy there. Um, other species that we're maybe not seeing as many of, certainly goshawk numbers of really reduced um, turkey vultures, we're seeing more. Uh, and what are these reasons? Why are we not seeing that? I think there's many, many factors. And I don't think that I'm qualified to say exactly why, uh, but I'm sure that we have something to do with it as humans. Uh, I'm sure there's a bit of climate involved in there as well, uh, changing habitat. So there's many things, um, you know, these birds are under a lot of pressure. Uh, but, you know, we, we do see, um, you know, rough-legged hogs seem to be doing pretty well. We had a record year last fall uh, for rough-legged hogs, but we didn't see any red-tailed hogs. And apparently you guys, I think you got every single red tail <laughs> in North, Eastern North America last year, looking at the numbers. Uh, but in general, it's, you know, I, I think in general things are on the downturn, but there are a few success stories. Peregrine falcons is another one that has really bounced back since the, uh, you know, getting rid of DDT and things like that and the monitoring. So, um, you, you know, we shouldn't all, you shouldn't be completely downcast about it, but there, you know, I think we are seeing, uh, we're seeing some low numbers more dramatically in some species than the others, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, and one more question here. It says, you explain the root of the word occipiter and yeah. why these birds were grouped as occipiters. Is there a similar explanation to help remember, and I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, budios? Budio, perfect, yeah. Yeah, so the budio is um, basically, is means saw, to saw, the soaring hawks. So, it's, uh, you know, they, they have these Latin names, a lot of them that we can't pronounce, but there is some, you know, there's, there, is a, there, there, there is a good reason in there somewhere, but the budios are the, the soaring hawks, the red tails, the rough leg, the broad wing. There's a big family of them, but they're generally the ones that we see. We, there are budios in South America, in Europe, and so on and so forth, but, um, they were kind of the key ones. Um, the Harrier is circus. <laughs> um, um, so they all have, yes, they all do. But generally you can say it, it's a budio. It's a, it was a soaring hawk, um, that kind of thing.